Arizona Democrats erupting in chants of protest as Republicans block an effort to repeal a near total abortion ban. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to West Coast Wrap. I'm Alex Savage. Today's emotional outburst at the state capitol came the day after Arizona's Supreme Court revived an 1860s abortion law. As Fox 10's Steve Nielsen reports, those who want it repealed insist their fight is not over. A war of words at the Capitol, Democrats shouting at Republicans, Republicans calling Democrats childish. There's little clarity on what comes next. A loud scene on the House floor in the middle of a vote, the Republicans vote to recess and the Democrats responded. Were you one of the ones shouting shame? I was not shouting shame with my mouth. <laughs> At issue, an 1864 abortion law. Tuesday, the state Supreme Court ruled the state can enforce the near total abortion law for more than a century ago, as opposed to a 2022 law banning abortion at 15 weeks. If this remains the way it is, this has dire consequences. People will die. Democrats have rallied to vote on a bill that would rescind the 1864 ban and, in effect, enforce the 2022 law. Some Republicans were vocal about opposing the 1864 ruling, giving hope to Dems for a vote today. In the Senate, no vote came. We are recessed sub subject to the Senate of the gavel. There is no Senate bill. So there is nothing to vote on. In the House, there is a bill. Republican Representative Matt Gress motioned for a vote. I think, though, it, it will be assured okay. that this bill will pass the House. This issue is not going away. Arizonans want us to take action, and we will. But before a vote could take place, they went to recess. When recess ended, Republicans defended themselves. Democrats are screaming at us and engaging in extremist and insurrectionist behavior. Republicans voted to adjourn by just one vote. The speaker says they need time. Instead of us all taking some time, letting this settle, having an honest debate when, when cooler heads can have this conversation, we're, 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 we're doing this. The shenanigans and the childish baby we saw earlier. And the speaker said if this bill passes, it would still only take effect 90 days after the session. So it doesn't matter if it passes today or in the next two weeks. He would not commit to putting it up for a vote next week. Steve Nielsen, Fox 10 News. Former President Trump said today he believes the Arizona abortion ruling goes too far. The presumptive GOP presidential nominee made those comments during a campaign stop in Atlanta. Trump's call for Arizona lawmakers to change the restrictive abortion measure comes just days after he posted a video on social media saying the issue should be left up to the states. Arizona go too far. Yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out. And as you know, it's all about states' rights. That'll be straightened out. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taken care of, I think, very quickly. What do you think about Florida? Uh, Florida is Florida's probably maybe going to change also. See, it's all of what the, it's the will of the people. This is what I've been saying. It's a perfect system. Trump was referring to a Florida law that bans abortions after six weeks. It's set to take effect at the beginning of next month. The former president was also asked today a number of other questions by reporters, including whether he supports a national abortion ban. The former president has faced some criticism from conservatives who are pushing for a national abortion ban. In light of the Arizona abortion ruling, congressional Democrats gathered on Capitol Hill today to reaffirm their fight to protect reproductive freedoms. Republicans are simply too extreme for everyday Americans and aren't focused on the priorities of working families. This is the contrast that we're going to continue to highlight here in Congress and back in our communities. House Democrats made it clear the November election will be vital to reproductive rights. They also said voters will remember what elected officials have said in the past about access to abortion. The same politicians who co-sponsored the Life at Conception Act to end all abortion and celebrated the Dobbs decision are trying to distance themselves from the Arizona Supreme Court ruling. The American people are smart. They know when politicians are talking out of both sides of their mouths. 
At least seven states will have measures on the November ballot related to abortion access. In southwest Utah, some people are preparing to evacuate tonight after cracks were discovered in a dam. First responders are calling the situation at Penguich Lake Dam an emergency. They've already shut down a stretch of nearby Highway 143 that's saturated with water. Garfield County officials shared photos of cracks along the upper portion of the dam. They're calling this a level two emergency, meaning the dam could fail. A level three emergency would indicate imminent failure. To reduce the risk, dam operators are releasing some water from the reservoir. They have not said what may have caused the cracks. This dam was inspected last year and found to be in satisfactory condition. Today in Boise, Idaho, prosecutors told jurors triple murder suspect Chad Daybell crafted an alternate reality to justify the killings of his wife and his new girlfriend's two children. Daybell is a self-published doomsday fiction author who prosecutors say created an apocalyptic scheme with girlfriend Lori Vallow that referenced the children as zombies. They claim it was intended to limit obstacles to their relationship and obtain survivor benefits and life insurance money. The girlfriend received a life sentence without parole for the killings last year. Daybell has pleaded not guilty. His trial should last about two months. In Orange County, opening statements were held today in the trial of a man accused of murdering a college student six years ago. Prosecutors say 26-year-old Samuel Woodward stabbed 19-year-old Blaze Bernstein to death because he was gay and Jewish. Woodward has pleaded not guilty to murder with a hate crime enhancement. The prosecution said Woodward joined a violent, anti-gay, anti-Semitic group and had contacted Bernstein online. The two had attended the same high school in Orange County. The defendant brought a folding knife, his Adam Waffen mask, a device to bury, a shovel and a sleeping bag, and picked up Blaze Bernstein. Blaze Bernstein's sexual orientation had absolutely nothing to do with the reason he was killed. The defense attorney did not dispute that his client carried out the fatal attack, but he said Woodward did not plan to kill anyone and didn't hate Bernstein. Woodward is expected to testify during this trial, which could last for several months. A new report has found cases of anti-Muslim hate in America are on the rise following the start of the Israel-Hamas war. As Fox 5's Misha DeBono reports, local advocates in San Diego are calling for action. Our elected officials have yet to declare a ceasefire resolution across San Diego County. And we demand that today. Members of the Council of American Islamic Relations, along with civil rights advocates, students and local administrators, gathered to demand that local leaders call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and protect them from the recent rise in Islamic hate, as well as protect their right to speak out against the war in Gaza. 8,061 complaints were filed for anti-Muslim incidences across the nation. The Council on American Islamic Relations, or CAR as it's known, released its annual civil rights report, which documents a major increase in anti-Muslim hate. In the months following the attack on Israel, there were more than 8,000 reported incidents across the country. Here in San Diego, there's been a 300 percent increase. A lot of the cases that we receive in our office reflect employment discrimination, hate incidences happening in the community. Incidents have been reported in students as young as K through 12 and up through college. I have seen also students being bullied at school just because of their names and because of uh, they are Muslims or Arabs or Palestinians. This young man attends San Diego State and says the university has not done enough to support them or protect their right to free speech. They have chosen to ignore us. They have chosen to allow us to be attacked. And so we will hold them accountable. And that's really their bigger message here, holding those in power accountable. We as American Muslims are being targeted and singleized. Our ask is for the Biden administration to declare a permanent ceasefire. We're asking that we, as a community, not be stifled. Our speech not be restricted, our freedom of expression, and our First Amendment rights not be taken away from us. And that's really their message to stop any type of racial or religious hatred whatsoever. And they say to hold elected officials, city, state, and federal, President Biden, accountable to make sure that their First Amendment rights are protected. From Kearney Mesa, I'm Misha DeBono.
Tributes are pouring in tonight as Stanford women's basketball coach Tara Vanderveer announces her retirement after 38 seasons. Sometimes it's just uh, you're ready, and I, I just felt uh, I'm ready. I never really thought I would be. I kind of just, you know, just felt like maybe I would, you know, kind of just keel over on the bench. But, you know, I mean, I just, you know, I, I, because I love it. I love it. I love it. She does love coaching basketball. The 70-year-old retires as the winningest coach in NCAA history, only taking one year off to coach Team USA to a gold medal in 1996. Vanderveer's first Stanford recruit said the coach's impact cannot be measured. I think along the way she's done everything to fight for women and for women's basketball. Women's basketball is on the map and it's here to stay, and Tara is a large part of that. Here are just a few of the stats from her historic career. Vanderveer has won 1,216 games, and she led the Cardinal to 15 Pac-12 championships, 14 Final Four appearances, and three national championships. What a career. Up next tonight here on West Coast Wrap, a new partnership designed to disrupt the flow of fentanyl across the southern border. Tonight, how two federal agencies are joining forces to focus on drug smuggling. Plus, a Boeing whistleblower's claims have the attention of Congress. We'll break down how he's exposing what he calls dangerous construction of planes. And in Barry weather, here's our live uh, look out toward Alcatraz, out toward the Golden Gate Bridge. A bit of a warm up in San Francisco for today, but other parts of the West Coast, we're talking about uh, some clouds and even uh, some warming eventually moving back in as we head toward Thursday. We will have the update coming up. A new crackdown at the southern border is targeting drug smugglers. Border Patrol agents have announced a joint effort with the Drug Enforcement Agency. They did so today in Nogales, Arizona. They're calling this Operation Plaza Strike. They say they'll work together to disrupt the flow of fentanyl into the U.S. The first phase of their effort will focus on drug smuggling in the Nogales area. You're responsible for the poisoning of our people. We know who you are and we are bringing the full force of the federal government to shut you down and deliver justice. This is a fight we take personally on one we simply will not lose. Border Patrol agents say they're also expanding what they call Operation Apollo. It is already proving to be successful along California's southern border. That operation allows local, state and federal agencies to all work together to try to take down fentanyl supply chains. A Boeing employee is making some damaging allegations against the plane maker. The quality engineer claims the company has a history of manufacturing shortcuts. Fox's A.J. Janavel shares with us the extent of the accusations and Boeing's response to those claims. Now these two U.S. senators want to speak to that whistleblower, Sam Salapur. Salapur has worked with Boeing for about a decade. For years, he says, he tried to get attention on this shoddy workmanship, but he says instead he was retaliated against. Boeing manufactures most of the planes that we all fly in, uh, and it's become increasingly clear that they have put profits over safety, uh, and we are not necessarily safe anymore getting onto an airplane. Sam Salapur, a quality engineer with Boeing for more than a decade, who has about 40 years of experience in the aerospace industry, says he went to his higher-ups years ago to report hasty and dangerous manufacturing on Boeing's 787 and 777 plane models. Salapur was concerned by shortcuts he saw where parts of the plane were physically forced together. Like puzzle pieces, jump, literally jumping up and down on the pieces of the fuselage to get them to line up. With the 787, it's an issue of these gaps. Attorney Lisa Banks um, is representing Salapur. She tells me for years her client tried to get attention on the issue through the internal channels within Boeing, but he was instead retaliated against, ostracized, and even threatened with violence by other coworkers. In January of this year, Salapur went to the FAA. They have assigned a very large team by their account to investigate this matter, so they appear to be taking it seriously. I reached out to the FAA, who replied with this statement. And now, United States Senators Richard Blumenthal and Ron Johnson are involved. 
Through the Senate Permanent Subcommittee of Investigations, they sent this letter to the FAA requesting details of the FAA's work into the whistleblower's concerns. And this letter to Boeing CEO David Calhoun requesting he answer questions about these claims during a subcommittee hearing next week. Weeks ago, Calhoun had already announced plans to step down from Boeing by the end of the year. I spoke with an official with Boeing today who tells me the company stands by their planes and says this whistleblower's accusations are inaccurate. Reporting here in Renton, I'm AJ Janova, Fox 13 News. We're learning tonight about an Air Canada flight that was forced to make an emergency landing in Idaho after a warning light went off. Air Canada said in a statement that Boeing 737 MAX 8 plane landed safely in Boise yesterday. The flight was headed from Mexico City to Vancouver when there was the in-flight emergency and the plane diverted. The airline says the warning light was related to a malfunctioning cargo hold, but it has not released any more details. All right, we turn now to our weather and a mysterious wind event damaged a business in Oregon. A sudden strong gust of wind swept over an area of McMinnville yesterday afternoon. This is northwest of Salem. The National Weather Service is working right now to figure out what generated winds that were strong enough to wreck a skylight and ventilation system. For more on our forecast moving forward here across the West, let's bring in KTVU meteorologist Mark Tamayo, who is tracking those conditions, and we have changes in store in the coming days. Yeah, definitely some changes from warm to eventually some cooling, and I was uh, taking a look at some of the reports uh, with that uh, wind event uh, up in Oregon and reports that it, it could be a dust devil, meaning there could be unequal heating on, on the surface, uh, and as a result, you get a, a localized area of low pressure that could lead to that circulation that could lead to that uh, that wind damage. So that was the, the thinking up, um, up in the Pacific Northwest. As you can see, though, on the satellite, and there's not a lot to show you across California in terms of cloud cover. We do have some clouds moving into Seattle. We are watching this system out here. This will eventually kind of uh, approach uh, the, the northwest and also portions of California over the coming days. Right now, though, just some fog hanging out near portions of the shoreline near San Francisco. And this was a scene today in Seattle showing you a sun, a sun cloud mix. Temperature of 58 degrees in San Francisco, a classic summertime pattern with the fog near the Golden Gate Bridge sneaking locally into the bay. But it was still warm in downtown San Francisco in the lower 70s and in Phoenix today, a high of 87 degrees with lots of sunshine. Current numbers out there, as you can see right now, it is uh, in the 50s for Seattle, 56 degrees, San Francisco 62, Las Vegas 76, and Phoenix right now checking in 84 degrees. So here is the plan tomorrow. Some changes up in the north. So we are tracking this system, this cold front. This will uh, boost the rain chances up in Seattle for tomorrow. Clearing skies for San Francisco. It's another nice day in the in the Bay Area for tomorrow. A nice warmer forecast for uh, Phoenix with temperatures in the 90s and uh, some uh, sunshine out toward Denver with temperatures in the 60s. In Phoenix, you can see the breakdown throughout the day tomorrow. Temperatures you can see uh, warming up nicely into the afternoon hours and we see a return of the 90s by 3 and by 4 o'clock. We're thinking that we're at 92, maybe 93 degrees and still fairly mild heading into your Thursday evening. So here's the forecast model. It's picking up on the next uh, rain band approaching Seattle for tomorrow. Chance of some rain approaching Portland. It is still dry in California, but things could be changing though. As we head toward Friday, definitely some more clouds spilling in. This system will first send in some cooler air, a significant drop off for those numbers. And then by Saturday, this will be a rain producer for San Francisco and also down toward Los Angeles as well. So here's the breakdown over the next several days for Seattle. We're talking about some rain chances, as you can see, that rain cloud for your Thursday. And then for San Francisco, that rain line gradually spreads to the south eventually by Saturday. Same story for Los Angeles, also linked up with that big time cool down as well. You can see lots of sun shine out toward Phoenix. Once again, temperatures approaching the 90s, right? 93 to 94 degrees. So some cooling up to the north, but still fairly warm, warm in parts of the south, especially out in Arizona. Alex. Okay, Mark, thank you. Okay. Coming up tonight here on West Coast Wrap, an Arizona coffee shop serving up more than just drinks. Tonight, see how it's sending special needs students out the door with some inspiration. Also, a world championship is on the line, and we'll show you how go-kart racers here in the West are getting ready.
The latest government report shows inflation remains high, and that means the Federal Reserve likely won't lower interest rates anytime soon. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Consumer Price Index shows the price of everyday goods rose 3.5% in March compared to a year earlier. The CPI was also up four-tenths of a percent from February to March. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell had previously indicated that interest rate cuts could be coming at the Fed's next big meeting in June. Now, Powell says inflation needs to retreat substantially to about 2% before that can happen. And that inflation report sent stocks tumbling today. The Dow closed down 422 points. The Nasdaq lost 136 points. And the S&P 500 lost just under 50 points. A coffee shop in Arizona is hiring local high school students with special needs. Fox 10's Desiree Flewellen spoke with the owner about the vision behind this partnership. I love food, I love coffee, and I love community. See those bubbles? We don't want Thomas bubbles. Porter is the owner of The Coffee Builders. We've got espresso, uh, we've got matchas and teas, things like that as well, um, chai, you name it. The coffee shop also has a really special relationship with students at the academies at South Mountain. I think it's wonderful to have a partnership in the community. Carly Bacha is the transitional teacher for the school's Upward and Onward program. It's a program helping children with special needs achieve their highest potential. The whole goal of the program is for students to work on skills to be successful in their home, navigating the community and workplace skills. It's awesome. It's so much fun seeing someone learn something new and get really excited. Student Casey Griffith is here working today learning how to make espresso. Casey says he really enjoys working here. Can I love copy. The program gives students work experience and mentorship that will prove to be invaluable. The Coffee Builders is on the corner of 7th Street and East Buckeye Road in Phoenix, open Monday through Saturday. Desiree Flewellen, Fox 10 News. Two kids in Colorado are practicing their go-kart skills as they prepare to race in the Go K1 Speed World Championship. Neighbors, 11-year-old Haley and 15-year-old Luke are both go-kart state champions. Haley's racing career started as a fluke, placing competitive race times after visiting the track on a whim. Luke also had a speedy path to victory. His father says Luke was on the podium around his fifth race. The pair have been able to win some significant prizes so far, and Luke has his eyes on something even bigger. I've won a couple of trophies and a bunch of medals, uh -huh. and then I won a couple of gift cards as well. One state, I'll be heading to June for the nationals, and that'll be an outdoor cart like I did this weekend. Yeah. And if I win that, I get $10,000. The Go Cade 1 Speed World Championship is broken down into junior, teen, and adult categories with just one winner coming out on top in each age group, and we wish them the best in that championship event. That does it for West Coast Wrap. Thank you so much for watching tonight. A reminder here before we go, you can catch up on all the stories we're covering at westcoastwrap.com. Have a great night. See you tomorrow.